In 1991, a sprightly guard named Michael Adams averaged an incredible 26 points and 10 assists per game for the Denver Nuggets. Adams was the first player to notch 25 and 10 since 1973, back when Tiny Archibald did it, and he joined Oscar Robertson as only the third player ever to accomplish the feat. Based on this common slash line of points, rebounds, and assists per game, Adams looks like a basketball god. Heck, only 13 players have even averaged 20 points, 9 assists, and 3.5 boards a night, and as you can see, some monster names like LeBron, Magic, and Chris Paul never posted a 25 and 10 season like Adams. But does that mean Adams' 25 and 10 was better than Magic Johnson's best year? Why do more advanced stats view Magic as orders of magnitude better? This is part one of a series on NBA statistics, what they are, what they aren't, and most importantly, how they help us understand basketball. In this series, we'll explore the best and worst of just about every publicly available stat and highlight the strengths and weaknesses of these analytical tools. It turns out that some stats actually cloud the picture and make the game harder for us to understand. The traditional slash line of points, rebounds, and assists per game has done that in a way. Tallying up these major numbers is a good idea, as they're all part of the story when figuring out who impacted the scoreboard, but points, rebounds, and assists leave out an enormous amount of what's happening on the court. On the surface, they tell us nothing about defense, which is half of the game, but even on offense, reducing the sport to points, rebounds, and assists is woefully incomplete. I'm not sure anyone, even Michael Adams' mother, ever thought Adams was better than Magic Johnson or any other elite point guard in 1991 despite those gaudy numbers. So how does the slash line go wrong? Well, first, it doesn't tell us about the quality of scoring. How efficient was it in a player's role based on his teammates? In other words, where were those points coming from? These two points, an open dunk, and these two points, a difficult shot, are not created equally. Similarly, assists don't tell us too much about the quality of passes or how much someone like Michael Adams helped his teammates score. If we want to figure out how a player raises the efficiency of his team's offense, we'd need to dig deeper, beyond the raw points, rebounds, and assists paradigm. In 1974, the league started tracking blocks and steals too, and you'll often see blocks and steals tacked onto the slash line to approximate defensive worth. The same ideas hold here too. We need way more information to understand just how much a defender lowers the other team's scoring efficiency when he's on the court. Steals can be a positive indicator, but steals can also lead us astray. Sometimes players rack up steals by gambling, yet there's no stat that keeps track of missed steals. Sometimes defenders chase blocks and give up valuable rebounds, but there's no block chasing stat either. The biggest takeaway to remember throughout this series, and whenever you encounter a new basketball stat, anywhere really, is that these are measurements, and it always helps to think of these numbers as measurements, as the result of tallying up a bunch of stuff. This helps remind us to ask two really important questions when we encounter any stat. What is this thing measuring, and how does it relate to helping a team win? Take field goal percentage, for instance. It measures all the different shots a player takes, covered or uncovered, close or far from the hoop, but it does not measure shooting ability. If we care about winning basketball, some measurements are actually quite useless. For instance, it probably doesn't matter who makes the most half-court shots in a season. Occasionally, we can take a measurement at face value. The leaders in free throw percentage are usually the best free throw shooters, but most measurements require context and further information for us to reach accurate conclusions about beyond the measurement itself. Without even mentioning shooting percentages, we'll save that for the next video. What if I told you that in 1991, Michael Adams' Nuggets finished with the 21st ranked offense and Magic Johnson's Lakers finished with the 5th ranked offense? What if I told you that Adams played with another 25 point per game scorer and that Magic's highest scoring teammate averaged 21 per night, but no one else was over 15? Armed with just a little additional information, we can begin to see that Adams' stats and Magic's stats were created very differently. 
And that's precisely the point. Most raw basketball stats need contextualizing. They need additional information for us to reach conclusions about skill, performance, and a player's overall impact. Measuring points, rebounds, and assists is smart, but as a three-number summary of a player's impact, the slash line is woefully incomplete and can walk us into major traps. It could make it look like in 1991, Michael Adams, leader of the 20-win Denver Nuggets, is one of the greatest point guards ever. So whenever you see a player described with his classic slash line, 21, 5, and 4, 18, 3, and 3, or whatever it is, remember to be extremely cautious and ask for much more information. In Thinking Basketball the Book, I explain in detail why we have to rely on statistics in some sports and why sample sizes then become so important. Also, episode number three of the Thinking Basketball podcast is a meta conversation related to this series about the pitfalls of analytics. Remember to check the video description box too. I'll put links and sources in there throughout. A huge thanks to Patreon supporters at patreon.com thinkingbasketball for helping me make these videos. And as always, I hope you're having a great day.